tells all the commands run, uh, their status, whether they succeeded or failed, and the timestamps when they were attempted. Uh, again, this will be a pretty technical talk, but before we deep dive, we wanted to provide uh, kind of some main takeaways to keep in mind as we go through the technical details. Um, so the first point we have here is we want to emphasize that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than you may originally think. Um, as Vaishnav stated before, we're dealing with three different AWS organizations that total over 3,000 AWS accounts. Uh, not only that, but in each account, we have various types of EC2 instances running. Um, these instances all have varying forms of encryption and may or may not have some level of logging or network connectivity. So our solution, uh, when we were designing it, it really had to consider cross-account access, EBS and snapshot encryption, uh, sharing KMS keys, for example, and varying levels of access logging. Um, so that's point one. Point two uh, is pretty straightforward, but if you automate a task correctly, your mean time to respond, um, your cost, and your error rate should all go down. Uh, this one, again, is pretty self-explanatory, but even though we invested a lot of time in building this solution and getting it off the ground, uh, we believe that our return on investment is high and we're saving the firm money and time in the long run. Um, so next, we wanted something that could scale easily. Uh, you know, Given our footprint in AWS, we're dealing with a kind of a large magnitude of accounts, and that's why we chose to use a lot of uh, native AWS services. Um, all of our resources are spun up and used only when needed, and when we don't need them, they're not running. Um, so this really helps reduce cost and increase efficiency. And uh, lastly, so we wanted to do this, accomplish this to be uh, independently, to be done you know, uh, in a parallel manner. So in a similar vein, uh, a collector VM instance is spun up per volume to be collected so that the volumes that we um, collect are uh, being processed in parallel. So the second thing we want to talk about is full disk versus triage collection. So we focused on a full DD image uh, for this process, mainly due to the regulatory requirements uh, in our industry. However, uh, triage collection could be appropriate for your use case. Uh, we're basically doing the best of both worlds. So we, we do a full DD uh, capture but we're also uh, stream relevant log files uh, via the CloudWatch logs agent uh, from production EC2 instances to basically fulfill the use case of a triage collection. So we have access to the logs before, uh, before we collect the full disk. And then lastly, or uh, thirdly, streaming evidence directly to S3. So we stream the DC3 DD output directly to S3 without um, any intermediary storage. Um, this is to reduce the resource consumption of our collector VM instance. Awesome. So if we move on to point number four here. Um, so our entire process is audible with CloudTrail and done with VPC endpoints to ensure that everything is transmitted over to the backbone AWS network. And having an internal audit trail of our actions is also very important. So you can tell someone specifically uh, what you did and when you did it. So our legal and risk team loved us for that. Um, the next point here is basically how fast do you everybody else for uh, being patient with us. Um, all right, I will uh, let you take it away. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. 
Today we'll talk about automating binary deobfuscation processes using dynamic taint analysis and symbolic code execution. We'll be focusing uh, solely on code virtualization and how we could deobfuscate that. My name is Berk. I work as a threat intel analyst. Uh, I'm a theater graduate and I have over five years uh, experience in pen testing and red teaming. My friend Osama here is uh, an R&D engineer at Trapmine. Uh, Second, I'm just going to okay. Hopefully, you can still see my screen. Um, this is wrong. Yeah. All right. So uh, we will uh, focus on code visualization 
Everyone, thanks for waiting. We still have some significant AV issues from the presenter. Uh, we are still working through them as best we can. Sorry about this. Uh, then everything is fine. So you don't have to deal with words and bytes, etc. Um, great. Do I go to the? All right, great. So um, with uh, 32 stack machines, we said that we we can use less opcodes because of this, and uh, you have a minimal processor stack to keep track of. Uh, an example can be maybe, uh, I think JVM used to be a 32-bit stack machine and then it, they switched to a 32-bit stack and register machine. So you also don't have, you don't deal with registers and you don't deal with flags. So uh, for our code visualization, uh, we, we, we made this 32-bit stack machine and it supports 11 instructions, uh, fairly simple. Uh, we have arithmetic operations, comparison, store and load, uh, conditionals, read and write instructions. Uh, in addition, we have uh, a rot instruction. Uh, this rot instruction allows us to rotate things on the stack, which makes it just easier for us. Uh, you can actually use any two instructions. Uh, sorry, like eight, two instructions is enough to do, to do whatever you want to do. But uh, we were more comfortable with 11. So to illustrate, uh, how this would work, it's basically like assembly, uh, but I'm just going to go over this one example that we uh, we worked on, uh, getting the absolute value of an integer, right? So our input is minus five, we get it using read, um, and then we duplicate it, we use dup to uh, copy it on top of the stack, and then we push zero. Now we will use this zero to, to check if uh, minus five is greater than or less than zero. Uh, we use our GT instruction and it returns one uh, if minus five is less than zero. So now we push nine on top of the stack. The reason why we push nine is because we would actually uh, jump to instruction nine. Uh, so this is where we're going to jump to uh, after a conditional jump. So here we have our conditional jump. Uh, since it returned one, that means it's uh, less than zero, so our input, so it's a negative value. Now we basically push uh, minus one on top of the stack, and then uh, we multiply minus one with minus five, thus getting the uh, absolute value of uh, our given input. And then, of course, we would have to write that uh, back up uh, onto uh, standard output here in this case. So our interpreter structure is fairly straightforward. We fetch, we decode, so bytecode comes and we uh, understand where this is going to go. Uh, and then we handle it. Every, uh, so a handler is basically a routine that handles your uh, virtual instruction. For every, uh, for every instruction, you need a different plan handler. And then of course we terminate after, we kill the process after all of the handlers uh, or routines uh, have been run. So this is the diagram as you can see. I'm just speeding up a little bit 
uh, because we've lost uh, quite an amount of time. So here you can see, uh, if you can see our class named interpreter, uh, you can see that we have a pointer to the beginning of our stack, a pointer uh, to the program we're going to run, uh, the size of our program, and the program counter to see uh, which instruction we're going to run next. There are commercial virtualization providers. Uh, these do a much more complicated job than uh, our, our uh, implementation does. Uh, they actually also uh, work as a cryptor and a packer. Uh, the Tigress C diversifier obfuscator is, is a good one. Uh, it's generally used for, as far as we've seen, uh, academic uh, research. Uh, VM Protect is VM Protect and Tamida, you can actually see it used by attackers. Uh, VM Protect, even APK groups. And then there are, of course, many other alternatives. But please mind that these uh, solutions are also used for digital rights management and uh, for basically any non malicious purpose uh, where you don't want people reverse engineering your code. Now, back to our uh, deobfuscation techniques we mentioned earlier. The first one is dynamic taint analysis. Taint analysis is, uh, we use it to track the flow of information in a program. Uh, specifically, uh, to put it, the track of information uh, between two certain, uh, not two, uh, certain points uh, in a program. We do this by labeling certain memory locations uh, as tainted, and then we propagate this taint uh, throughout the different memory locations. Uh, so if a memory, if any value, uh, gets generated or derived from a tainted memory location, we also taint that uh, memory location where that single value is being held. We do that for everything that derives from uh, a taint source. Uh, and then we call uh, we call the other tainted values uh, sinks. So portions of the memory, uh, so portions of the code that use that memory space, sorry, are the sinks. So the way we track information, we do it via taint policies. Uh, they're very important to us to get actual results that you can use. So just to go over the terminology here, if um, if anything derives, if any value derives from a, a taint source, that value is tainted. And any other value that derives from a tainted source, uh, a tainted uh, memory region is also tainted. So when we talk about policy, we have three properties, uh, taint introduction, propagation, and checking. Introduction is where we're going to introduce the taint. Propagation is how it's going to uh, spread out in memory. And taint checking is the action we're going to take once uh, a certain condition is met. So taint introduction, generally, uh, we can introduce this to user input, to library returns, or syscall return values, or uh, memory you read from a file and um, values you read from a file and things like that. Uh, this is a good example for taint propagation. It's very simple. We have variable A, uh, that's user input. Now we decide to taint user input in this example because we think that's uh, good for our purpose, right? So you choose what you're going to taint. So we take variable A and we put that in a memory region, A, and then we taint that region manually. And then in routine two, when uh, variable B is generated using A, uh, we also taint the memory region where variable B is being stored. And this will go uh, on forth. Now, you can use this uh, in exploitation prevention. Uh, let's say we have a shellcode, or, um, let's talk about a shellcode overwrite exploit example. Somebody has just uh, managed to push uh, shellcode on top of the stack. So, and this malicious shellcode will run, right? The moment, um, so how can we stop this? Is that if we taint all user input, and if execution at one point uh, in a, in time ever uh, goes to a place that is tainted, that means we are executing user supplied uh, code, right? User supplied region. So we can actually stop this with um, 
dynamic taint analysis engines. Uh, with ROP exploits, uh, you can do something very similar. You won't have shell code, but you will have a function pointer that's overwritten or a return address that's overwritten. So it, if any of these are overwritten with um, tainted values, uh, which are coming from user input in this scenario, you can actually stop execution. So here, an example is we have variable A again. And then in routine two, we are copying uh, variable A on to uh, B, right? We're using stir copy, but uh, as you can see, A is twice as big as B. So we'll be overwriting the return address. Now, uh, when execution, uh, the execution flow comes to the return address, we will see that it's tainted and the dynamic taint analysis engine, uh, so the, the, the dynamic binary instrumentation framework will actually stop execution there. Um, but, I mean, if this was the case, everybody would stop exploitation. The problem is that there's an expensive runtime overhead. Um, so I said we use dynamic binary instrumentation frameworks. And the way that this would work is that the code would be executed in the framework before, uh, so portions of the code would be executed there before they're actually executed uh, on the computer itself. Uh, so this brings a very uh, expensive runtime overhead. Another big challenge is how to define uh, the taint propag uh, to how to define the taint propagation uh, because there's you'll be dealing with data dependency, control flow dependency, and implicit flows. So a quick example: uh, you can use implicit flows as an anti-taint analysis method. Right? You have variable a, uh, which is your tainted method, but if the code basically uh, generates b, uh, variable b. So updates variable B using uh, tainted value A, but indirectly. As you can see here, it's uh, it gets incremented uh, twice the size of A. Now here, you can choose to taint uh, B as well, but then you will also be tainting other things that you wouldn't like to taint, and that would be over-tainting, uh, and you wouldn't get so good results. The same thing goes for under-tainting. Uh, in this example, there's under-tainting. So this is always a challenge you have to be dealing with. All right, um, I will now give my screen to Sama, if that's possible. And he can continue with symbolic code execution. Ah, okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I forgot to unmute myself. All right. Uh, I'll just repeat the few sentences that I spoke. So, Burke covered uh, the design and implementation of, a of the 32-bit virtual machine, the stack machine, that will, we will be using to demonstrate the application of uh, our deobfuscation procedures. Uh, our deobfuscation procedure comprises of two techniques, dynamic taint analysis and symbolic code execution. So, Burke covered uh, dynamic taint analysis, and uh, now we'll be moving on to symbolic code execution. <coughs> so, fundamentally, an execution of a program is a series of computations performed on data held in memory. Uh, the data is read, manipulated by the instructions, and then it is stored back in memory. Symbolic code execution works in the same way, except instead of actual values being manipulated, we work with symbols. That's the name. Uh, the result of computations are stored as expressions involving these symbols. So for example, uh, memory location one, logical and memory location two will be stored explicitly like that. Uh, 
So this allows us to consider logical formulas describing our program. And the advantage of this is that it gives us the ability to reason about our program and answers a few important questions that help us with program analysis and binary analysis problems. Uh, issues such as whether a particular program state is reachable uh, and such things. So uh, I'll go over a few use cases briefly of symbolic code execution. Uh, these include detecting infeasible paths, uh, generating test inputs to maximize code coverage. Uh, symbolic code execution is also used in conjunction with SAS solvers to generate input uh, for automatic export generation. Uh, however, in this presentation, the application of symbolic code execution we will be focusing on is backward slicing. We will discuss in detail what it is later, but uh, briefly for now, program slicing is used to find which set of instructions contribute to a value in, at a certain point uh, in the execution of a program. All right. So uh, in order to build an intuition of what symbolic execution is, uh, we will compare and contrast it with concrete execution. So concrete execution over here is uh, how normal execution happens, i.e. execution actual data. So uh, as we can see in the table illustrated on the slide over here, symbolic execution executes on symbolic values, whereas in concrete execution, we use actual values. With symbolic execution, we compute logical formulas over these symbols, whereas concrete execution determines exact values as determined by the execution. In symbolic execution, we also emulate all possible control flows. The reason for this is that what we're doing when we reach a condition statement is just creating a formula for it and then continuing on all execution paths normally. However, in concrete execution during one run, uh, we can only execute along one uh, control flow path. All right. So in order to uh, yeah, in order to explain um, properly what symbolic execution is, uh, I will go over a small example. Uh, but before that, we'll have to understand uh, a concept of the concept of symbolic state. So uh, symbolic state can be regarded as a parallel of concrete state of the program at any point in the execution. In, however, in the symbolic state, this, uh, this symbolic execution, the state comprises of two components, uh, the symbolic expressions and the path constraints. So symbolic expressions are, uh, are is either a symbolic value or a combination of other symbolic expressions. Uh, whereas path constraints encode the limitations on the symbolic expressions uh, as determined by the condition statements. So uh, briefly uh, going over this example, what we see on the left is some code with certain uh, with multiple different control flow paths. And on the right, what we see is uh, a graphical illustration of what a symbolic state might look like. So uh, we have three symbolic variables in this case, denoted by alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, and three concrete values, x, y, and z. Uh, concrete values actually take on actual data during the execution, whereas the symbolic uh, values are uh, represented by the logical formula. So the important thing to note over here is that the, the leaf nodes of the tree, it, denoted by the diamonds, uh, have certain logical formulas in them. These logical formulas uh, describe under what conditions this particular control flow path will be taken. All right, so, so far what we've done is we've covered uh, the theory, briefly the theory behind dynamic change analysis and symbolic code execution. So recapping uh, dynamic change analysis allows us to track information flow between uh, different sections of the program. Whereas symbolic code execution gives us the ability to reason about the program by constructing logical formulae uh, about the different uh, logical formulas regarding the different control flow paths. All right. So for the obfuscation procedure, the tool that we will be using is Triton. Uh, Triton allows us to perform symbolic execution, uh, backward slicing, and dynamic analysis. 
So in order to contextualize our deobfuscation procedure, what we will do is we will uh, run it over an example virtualized routine. So in this case, the virtualized routine that we're working with is a simple factorial algorithm. Uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with factorial. Uh, just going over briefly what that code describes is that we begin by checking whether input is greater than zero, input less than zero is obviously undefined. Uh, the factorial function then begins with the structure of this uh, stack as illustrated on the slide, uh, with the top of the stack being the counter, the second value being the running sum and the original value, and the third uh, uh, item on the stack being the uh, inputted value. Uh, we then manipulate the stack according to the logic necessary and arrive to, at the sum. So. Uh, the deobfuscation procedure we will be presenting is a uh, simplifi simplification of the approach described in the paper, symbolic deobfuscation, virtualized code back to the original. Um, the algorithm involves three steps, primarily. Uh, step one, or step zero, uh, would be identifying the region to analyze. The next step would be performing taint analysis to isolate pertinent instructions. And the final step would be reconstructing the virtualized routine. So uh, the first step, which is manually reverse, uh, re requires you to manually reverse engineer the binary in order to identify whether uh, a virtualized routine is present or not. Obviously, this requires some uh, experience handling and reverse engineering uh, virtualized code. Uh, there are some projects that attempt to do this automatically but they are such as vm hunt for example but they are not generic and what they generally do is look for heuristics uh of known uh they look for basically look for artifacts of known uh virtualization uh, vir virtual vir virtualization solution providers uh so they are pretty simple to circumvent by just d designing your vm machine so that those artifacts are not present so uh, dynamic taint analysis, which is the second step. Uh, we begin by identifying the source of input for the virtualized region. So the main purpose of this step is to isolate the VM machinery, meaning we want the set of the instructions that belong to the bytecode interpreter, which executes the virtualized routine at runtime. This step is conducted so we can pinpoint the region to emulate during symbolic execution. The virtualized routine is likely to be taking input from some external source, which determines its execution. So for example, in the factorial algorithm we presented, the, the routine takes input from the user, but the input, input co could come from anywhere, the, uh, any, any source of, in the external environment. Once the VM terminates, the results of its computations can be used by the rest of the program. Uh, so the approach is to identify where this input is taken from, then taint the memory location where this value is held. As the VM executes, the taint will propagate until we reach a predefined sync where this input is then used. The output of this instruction will be, uh, the output of this step will be an instruction trace of the VM execution. By doing this, what we have managed to do is to isolate the instructions uh, to some degree of accuracy that illustrate uh, not illustrate, uh, that define the execution trace of the virtual machine. So uh, I'll briefly discuss how one can go about finding tain sources. I mean, one approach would be to use uh, S trace or L trace to identify a possible library and system calls, and then uh, viewing their use in the assembly to see whether the input is used anywhere in the suspected code portion. But this is uh, this approach is simple and may not scale very well to complicated programs. So a better solution might be to use something like a binary instrumentation framework where we can automatically look at the values coming in from uh, different sources, track their progress through the execution and see whether they end up being used uh, in the suspected portion of the code. This might be a better approach for uh, uh, a more complicated program. So the final step in our deobfuscation procedure is symbolic execution. Uh, so so what we do is we perform symbolic execution uh, and then compute the backward slice from the VM output to the tainted input. So I'll go over 
uh, some of the details of these steps so we can understand what is going on over here. So symbolically executing the code. So what we do is we begin by symbolically executing the code from the taint source to the VM output. Uh, the reason for this is so that, uh, so in order to do this, what we need to do is we need to provide a memory map, which is something like a snapshot of the memory before we enter the uh, virtualized routine. The reason we do this is because we only want to symbolically emulate uh, the virtualized routine and not the entire program. Uh, this is so that we can actually drive execution to the uh, virtualized routine so that we can then begin to analyze it. Uh, this memory map can again be built using a DBR framework or a debugger uh, and such things. So as we symbolically execute each instruction, we build a symbolic expression for them. Uh, each instruction is defined as a function in big vector logic. Uh, so I, I will skip uh, some of the details about how uh, the symbolic construction of each of the instructions happens. Uh, but the main idea is that what we do, as mentioned before, what we do is we uh, construct uh, a, a logical formula associated with the memory locations being operated on. So uh, finally, we reached the point where we're actually in a position to perform the backward slice. The pseudocode for performing the backward slice is straightforward. Uh, we start at a given address. Uh, uh, we continue symbolically executing each instructions until we reach the point determined, uh, until we reach the point from which we want to compute uh, the backward slice. Uh, once we reach this point, uh, what we do is, uh, yeah, once we reach this point, we can compute the backward slice, which then gives us all of the previous instructions that contributed to the value uh, of the instruction at that point. Uh, what this will allow us to do is it will isolate uh, the virtualized algorithm from all of the VM machinery so that we can actually look at the data manipulations that happen uh, in order uh, for the uh, the routine, the obfuscated routine to generate its output. So, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, what we end up with is uh, uh, we get a trace representing all of the instructions that contribute to the value at the slice address. Uh, for our factorial function examples, once we execute this program, we get this neat little trace of alternating add and multiply instructions. Uh, working through these in a debugger and observing how the, uh, the values actually change across the execution, it's pretty simple to conclude that it's a factorial uh, function. However, for more complicated routines, it might not be that simple. However, at least what we have done so far is to completely isolate completely extract uh, the virtualized routine from the entire office, the virtualizing obfuscation. So uh, to recap what we've done so far is uh, by computing the backward slice, we have gotten our virtualized routine, which means we've effectively removed all instructions related to VM machinery and thus are left with the instructions that execute that that execute the logic of the virtualized program. So at this point, what we've, we've reached the final step. We've managed to extract the obfuscated routine and now uh, begins the grunt work of actually figuring out what that routine is trying to do. Uh, and that is the end of our talk. Uh, we are open to taking questions. And uh, if somebody cannot get their questions in right now, they can get in touch with us over Twitter and our handlers should be available on the screen right now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Burke and your Sama for, uh, for uh, bearing with us, for working through the technical difficulties and still being able to deliver your talk. Um, no problem at all. Thank you for organizing this event, especially during times like these. And thank you for uh, letting us present our work over here.